what's up? Making a proper fish and chips at home is a lot of work. There's no denying that fact. But in this video, I hope to convince you that just like growing your own tomatoes or baking your own bread, the payoff here is so sweet that a little bit of extra work and mess is undoubtedly worth it. The weekdays are for one pot meals and time savings. Today is all about the pure pursuit of crisp. <laughs> Okay, up front, the chips part of this recipe was a real pain to figure out. In the United States, every recipe for chips or fries uses a russet style potato. So that's where I started. And after four distinct attempts where I tried absolutely every single move I knew how to make crispy potatoes, the results were mixed at best. It seems that right now in the United States where I'm at, the russet potato just isn't gonna work for a really crisp french fry. They can be a workable option in a pinch, but I'd feel bad recommending them without this disclaimer. But I want everybody out there to have a memorable fish and chips experience at home. And there's two ways we can do that without a russet potato. The first and probably most accessible option is buy high quality frozen fries. In the United States and most of the world, 99% of the good fries you will have ever eaten in a restaurant we're frozen. Sorry, in and out your fries are fresh and they stink. So yes, I am recommending frozen French fries as one option and I don't have any shame about it. The second option and the one that I think has the most payoff, I'm gonna show you right now. For that, we need three to four pounds of Kennebec potatoes. These Kennebecs are the closest match that I have found in the US to the Maris Piper potato variety that's widely used in the UK chip shops. However, these might be hard to find though. So I'd say start by checking with your local produce supplier or maybe the buyer at your grocery store. Now, I'm gonna Peel these up using my Y peeler here. And from this point, we're basically just gonna replicate the exact same steps taken in the French fry or chip factory at home. Once these are all peeled up, I'm gonna grab a few quarts of cold water and then cut these into chips. I'm gonna cut off just the roundest parts of the sides of the potato here. It's prettier that way and it makes it much easier to cut. From there, I'm gonna size up how many three quarters inch slabs I can get out of each potato. I'm gonna cut those slabs and now I'm gonna cut these into the best squares that I can so that they cook evenly. If that means trimming off the edge of the last one to get these just right, so be it. I really wanna replicate the stubby, chunky chips that I've seen in pictures from the UK, and I think these look pretty close. Once we've got all four pounds of these potatoes cut up, we're gonna dunk them into my reserved cold water, splash some water around a little bit, and get as much starch off of these as I can. Now, we're gonna drain that off, replace it with fresh water, splash them around again. It's still cloudy, so back to the sink, drain it off, fill it back up with fresh water, splash them around one more time, and now these look pretty good. The water's clear and the potatoes look nice and clean. So I'm gonna put a lid on these and throw them in the refrigerator to soak. In a restaurant, this would be overnight for the sake of ease, but at home, it can be anywhere from two to 24 hours. I soaked mine overnight. The next day, I'm gonna pull these from the fridge and load a large heavy bottom pot onto my stove. Into that, I'm gonna measure 3,000 grams of water and 40 45 grams of white distilled vinegar. I learned this vinegar move from the legend himself, Kenji Lopez Alt. And according to the Kenj, this little bit of vinegar in the water helps strengthen the pectin on the outside of the potato. And that's huge because we're gonna be cooking these three times and it keeps the potatoes from totally breaking down. Once the water is at a boil, we're gonna dump in all of these chips and bring that water back to a simmer. I'm gonna cook these stirring occasionally for about 10 minutes. And after that 10 minutes, we're gonna come back and break one to check for doneness. It's cooked, these look good. Now, using a spider or a slotted spoon, I'm gonna transfer these chips to a wire rack to drain and cool off. From this point on, getting super crisp chips is all about dehydration. The more water we remove from the outside, the crisper the chip we're gonna get. I'm gonna blot these dry a little bit for good measure with a paper towel, and then we're gonna let them evaporate and cool for 15 to 20 minutes. In that time, I'm gonna dump this vinegar water out, dry the pot very well because water and oil don't get along. Then I'm gonna load it back on top of the stove top and grab a jug of neutral cooking oil. I'm loading about four inches of canola oil into my pot, but vegetable oil, soy oil, or beef towel will also work just fine. Once the oil is preheated to 285 degrees Fahrenheit, we're gonna lower in all of the chips. This low temperature fry is gonna further dehydrate the exterior, and that's gonna allow us to finish these chips at a hotter temp for longer, and that means a crispier chip. After five minutes at 285 degrees, we're gonna drain these well, move them back to the wire rack on the sheet tray, and as you can see, they're already starting to look kinda like chips. They're golden, and the exterior is now full of gelatinized potato starch. Now, these need to be chilled really hard to reach their full chip potential, so we're gonna throw them into the freezer for about 30 minutes. While those chill in the freezer, now it's time to talk fish for this fish and chips. For that, I've got roughly one to one and a quarter pounds of not frozen, but fresh Atlantic cod. This fish has a really firm flesh, and since it's fresh, it's not very wet. Frozen cod will work, but it needs to be dried very well before you use it. Now, we're gonna break these down into smaller pieces. That means a higher ratio of bread 
adding to fish, which me likey, and it also ensures the fish can cook quicker and more evenly, but more on that in a second. The cut I've got here is from the thicker loin end, so we're gonna cut it diagonally to get that classic tapered pub look. And it's up to you on how you wanna shape these. You can cut these into three pieces if you want. They're gonna cook a little bit faster, but once I've got mine broken down, I'm gonna season them with a light amount of salt on both sides. There is gonna be some salt in the batter, so we're not going too crazy. Speaking of batter, set that fish aside for about 10 minutes while we get the batter for the fish made up. For that, I'm gonna open up a 12 ounce beer. The type of beer is up to you. I like stuff that comes in a green bottle. That seems to work pretty well. And now I'm gonna grab a bowl and into that measure, 75 grams of all purpose flour, 75 grams of white rice flour, two grams of salt and two grams of baking powder. I'm gonna whisk these dry ingredients up and now I'm gonna keep whisking and stream in about 75% of this bottle of beer just to see where I'm at. You may need more or less beer depending on your setup, but this is the texture you want. It should be slightly thinner than you think. I made this mistake three times in a row before I figured out that the thick batter actually suffocates the fish and it steams in there instead of fries and the breading goes soft almost immediately. For best results, this beer batter needs to be very cold when we use it. So I'm gonna throw it into the fridge for a few minutes while we finish prepping everything else. Now, back to the fish. Salting them has drawn out a decent amount of moisture and that for sure needs to be eliminated for the ultimate crispness later on. So we're gonna gently blot these with portions of paper towel and just make sure to blot the tray too because that's also got some fish juice on it. Once we've got all these dry, we're gonna add one more step to make sure that we've got the crispest possible fish and to ensure that the batter sticks to these fish fillets. Into a plastic container, I'm gonna measure a 50-50 blend of rice flour and all-purpose flour, and it's maybe 25 grams of each. We're gonna coat the cod with whatever sticks. This is an insurance policy to make sure that the batter does not slip off when we take a bite. Once these are floured up, we're gonna move over to the fry pot and make sure the cold chips are also at the ready. These have been in the freezer for 30 minutes now, and they're pretty stiff and pretty frigid. It's gonna make a sick chip in just a minute. One last detail we need to hit before we fry, and that's DIY tartar sauce, of course. I don't know if tartar sauce is traditional in the UK with fish and chips, but in the US, in my house, it's totally essential, and it comes together in like five minutes. So for that, I'm gonna combine 175 grams of mayonnaise, 100 grams of chopped bread and butter pickles, 20 grams of capers, 10 grams of chopped parsley, 30 grams of minced and rinsed red onion, 40 grams of Dijon mustard, the juice of a half of a small lemon, and a small garlic clove that's pressed. I'm gonna stir all that up to combine, I'm gonna transfer that to a lid of container and set it aside. Okay, now it's go time. I'm gonna grab the batter from my refrigerator and check the temperature of my oil. I turned the pot back on while we were flouring the fish and now we're at 375 degrees. Perfect. Now, I'm gonna grab my cod filet and lower it into my batter one piece at a time. I'm gonna flip it over and make sure that it's really well coated, and then I'm gonna let all that excess batter drip off because more batter is definitely not more result as I spoke to earlier. So now we're gonna move this over to the fry pot and I'm gonna lower it in gently. I'm gonna let it fry for just a second before I let go. And when I do that, I'm gonna let it go away from my body. That way I don't splash hot oil all over my unsocked foot. I'm gonna batter the second piece and then repeat that, lowering it in very gently and dropping it away from my body. Now, with battered fish, we're cooking in a way that I don't use very often. And that's high heat real fast. 375 degree oil is quite hot and we're keeping it hot by only frying two pieces at a time. When fish is cooked too slowly and for too long, it goes way past the recommended 135 degrees Fahrenheit and we have some serious crispness issues. As fish becomes overcooked, the proteins inside seize up and squeeze out all kinds of water and that goes right into the crispy batter. And then we're very frustrated. After four minutes of frying total, we're golden and crisp and I'm gonna move this over to my wireline sheet tray. And let's look at this thing. That rice flour in the batter really makes a big difference in terms of brittle exterior. Let's cut real quick to a test batch. This is the same recipe but with cornstarch instead of rice flour and in my opinion it just sits really heavy on the fish it's a little bit more doughy and most importantly it's just not as crisp as rice flour and also i found that cornstarch didn't stick as well to the fish so I chose rice flour. As soon as these fish are out and on the wire rack, we're gonna lower in our chips and fry those between 350 and 360 degrees Fahrenheit for seven to eight minutes. If you're using store-bought fries, now would be the time to drop those. And I wanna mention, we're gonna be frying these chips in two batches so that the temperature of the oil doesn't drop too much. And I only fried two of my four pieces of fish because it's just me eating. And if you're worried about this fish sitting over there and getting soggy, this is what it's like after 35 minutes. Glassy. But back to the chips, as you can see, these are looking very good. The main problem with the russets was that they browned too quickly in this final hot oil step. The sugar in them caramelized well before the outsides were dehydrated and crisp, and that's just not ideal. After seven to eight minutes, these Kennebecs are just starting to brown and they feel very firm, almost like potato glass. I'm gonna pull them out and drain them really well with my spider, and then I'm gonna move them into a large bowl and season it with salt. Listen to these things. 
That is a crispy boy. These are creamy all the way through. They're deeply, deeply crunchy, and they're very potatoey. The fish is scented with hoppy beer, and it's perfectly coated in a thin veneer of glassy, crispy batter. You didn't know crispness at this level was available in the home. Now I've got my tartar sauce at the ready. I've got my malt vinegar at the ready. Let's eat this thing. <laughs> Before I get out of here, thank you to everybody who supports this channel on Kofi. If you want to learn more, the link will be in the description below, along with the whole recipe for this video. If you like this video, please consider giving it a like. And if you want to see more content from me, there's a couple videos over there that YouTube thinks you might like. As always, guys, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for sticking around, and we'll see you next time.